My name is Ruben Abito. I teach courses in interfaith studies and spirituality at Perkins School of Theology. I also oversee the spiritual formation program there and direct a certification program in spiritual direction. Some of you may be participating in that or may be interested in checking that out. This is a program that gives training for those who feel called to guide others in their spiritual journey. So I'm honored at this invitation by St. Michael and all angels to offer some reflections on being a Christian in today's multi-religious world. In the interest of disclosure, I must first say that this is a theme for a regular course I teach at Perkins every semester for master's level students preparing for Christian ministry for many years now. So I'd like to offer some highlights on this theme and suggest some areas for further exploration and reflection, and hopefully for Christian life and practice, inviting and maybe challenging everyone listening in. So let's begin by taking a bird's eye view and look around our global society. This earth community, which we share with all creatures, big and small. And as we look around, we cannot miss seeing that there's so much that is dysfunctional, disjointed, out of sync in this global family of ours. We are a dysfunctional family. First, while there's no lack of food supplies and goods produced to satisfy the needs of everyone on earth several times over, it is a fact that greater and greater numbers of the earth's population are being consigned to poverty, being deprived of the basic means to live even a decent human life. I can't go into detail now, but I'd like to mention one statistical factor for us to consider. The fact that roughly 20,000 children under the age of five die of malnutrition cost factors on a daily basis. That's a daily basis. While several dozen multi-billionaires own large, a large chunk of the Earth's wealth and only a small segment of the Earth's population concentrated in the so-called developed countries own the bulk of the Earth's goods. Consider that. Secondly, we have developed technological means of preserving and prolonging life. So we can do what it takes to preserve life. But yet, more and more people are dying of violence in different ways, from domestic and gang violence to armed conflicts fanned by political, ideological, ethnic, racial, and also economic and social, and if I may say, also religious factors. Thirdly, we have learned how to harness the forces of nature for our own human ends. And yet we are now experiencing a backlash with a looming and worsening ecological crisis that threatens our very survival as a human species on this planet. That is the sad state of our global situation as we look at it with a clear eye. Amidst all of this, what are people of religion doing? The fact that there are multiple religious traditions that inform the different ways we human beings live and relate to the world and to one another tends to be a factor that further separates us and divides us from one another. Specifically, religion tends to be used in ways that create walls separating us with our differences in claims about ultimate reality and the meaning of being human, and with attitudes proclaiming that only those belonging to our group or tribe will be saved and the rest be damned. Unfortunately, this is a tendency that many of us Christians also have to confess that we have the truth and we have the source of salvation and everybody, everyone else will go to hell. I'll talk more about that a little later, but with this kind of exclusivistic attitude, which is not only confined to Christians, but also in 
other religions that show that sense of superiority vis-a-vis -vis others. We can note also many incidents of religiously motivated violence that those of us who truly value our religion can only lament. In the light of this, a cry of Rodney King, who was a victim of police violence as sparked Los Angeles uprisings in the 1990s, comes to mind as an earnest cry of our age. Can't we all just get along? This indeed is a monumental task of our generation, as it has been for many generations of our human history. But now it comes to us with an urgency more than ever before. We are family. Can't we all just get along? And so what can our religious faith offer in terms of enabling us to be elements and factors and agents in us getting along as a global community. That's what we'd like to ask today. The Dalai Lama, well-known Nobel Prize Peace Awardee and the great spiritual leader of our time, who inspires people across different religions or of no religion, invokes adherents of the various religious communities to look at their respective core teachings and suggests that as we do so, each in our own ways, we will find that love is at the core of those teachings. If those of us belonging to our religious community highlight that love as a central feature of our teaching and the way we live, then we all may have a chance of overcoming those things that divide us and finding a way to work together toward a more peaceful, more just, and more sustainable world for us and for generations to come. Can we do that? Now, in describing the core message of our own Christian tradition, the Dalai Lama is right on the mark. Isn't it true? What is it to be a Christian? To be a Christian is to, be, to have heard the good news and to have accepted it by living a life enlightened by that good news and being inspired to live it and proclaim it to the world. And what is that good news? The good news that Jesus proclaimed to his followers, gushing forth from every act and word of his, is the good news that he himself heard, Jesus heard as he was being baptized on the Jordan River by John the Baptist. You are my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And the good news is that this is the message also being addressed to each and every one of us from all eternity in each our own unique and distinctive ways. And Jesus came to embody that and to show that, that we also are beloved and we are pleasing to the one who created us from all eternity. That's good news. To truly hear these words, these words is to realize in my, to realize my own infinite worth and to realize that this truth that I am beloved takes me beyond limitations of linear time and physical space. To hear these words up close and personal as addressed to me it's like holding the winning ticket in a cosmic lottery to take the words of Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton had this well-known and well-documented epiphany. He had a very deep experience as he was standing on the street of 4th and Walnut, which is now 4th and Muhammad Ali, I believe, in Louisville, Kentucky. As he was standing there, something came to him as he was looking at all the people walking around him with their hustle and bustle and so on. And he realized that each and every one of them was shining like the sun and that he loved them and that their lo that love also enveloped all of us. And that that love caused us to that eternal communion with one another. And so this is what he describes as a cosmic lottery whose prize is nothing less than eternal life suffused with infinite love in communion with all those that are beloved 
of God. This is the good news. You are beloved in whom I am well pleased. And if we look at each and every one around us, that same good news is being proclaimed to each and every one in their hearts. And all we have to do is listen with the eyes of our own heart and accept it and live in its accordance and live in its light. And this also is salvation, to be suffused in infinite love, celebrating this love with all beings in endless time. And it begins here and now in this earthly life of ours. It began even before we, are, we were born. But from the moment we hear these words as addressed to each one of us and accept it and welcome it into our lives and live out what it means for us, then the whole world is transformed beginning with ourselves. The word salvation comes from the Latin salus, related to the Spanish salud. As you know, when we toast in Spanish, salud is what we say to your health, to your wholeness. And this comes from the Greek holos, to be whole, complete, integrated, and healed. This is the fullness of our being that we are called to realize. And this means overcoming our divisions, our separations, our dysfunctions, and coming back home to where, to where we are most ourselves, where we can find joy and peace and a life oozing with gratitude for one another and with one another. So this wholeness is something that I am called to realize with the human community, with the earth community that is part of God's beloved creation, and that is salvation true wholeness and healing. And Jesus Christ is the one who shows us the way. For us Christians, the way of love, the way to wholeness, the way to healing is through Jesus Christ. Now who is Jesus Christ? The itinerant Jewish carpenter's son who walked the land of Palestine and Judea 2000 years ago and who preached love to the people who did wonders and showed signs that he was indeed sent from God and who was arrested and as a rabble rouser and, play, and put to death on the cross by Roman authorities, of course, comes to mind as the first referent. This same one, Jesus Christ, is the one who rose from the dead and conquered death forever for all of us and who reigns now in glory in the heavens. Yes, Jesus is all that. Jesus Christ is all that. But the Christ that Jesus is, that was embodied fully in Jesus, also calls us to keep our eyes and ears open and to be able to see where that Christ resides. And we may find that Christ in places closer to us than we think. In Matthew 25, verses 31 to 42, we read, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Jesus Christ is the one who showed us the way of love, the way to wholeness, to salvation, and to healing. And this passage of Matthew gives us a glimpse of where that love is waiting to be activated and how that healing might occur in our world today. This passage is an important clue that tells us what being a Christian is about. Now, how is a Christian to relate to people of other religious traditions? And this is the question of our talk today. This question can easily be rephrased in this way, given what we've said above. How may a Christian embody that love that makes a Christian a Christian toward people of other religions? There you have it. That's the lead question for all of us in considering on being a Christian in a multi-religious world. How may we embody the love that makes us who we are? 
So that path to, that an, to, to answering that should be clear by now. But we need to keep asking it, given that all too many Christians have been raised with and still continue to hold on to the idea, citing some passages from the Bible as proof texts, that Christians have a monopoly on truth and salvation, and that those others will be damned to hell. This is called the exclusivistic view of other religions. This is a total misreading of sacred scriptures, and sad to say, it is this kind of attitude found not only among Christians, but also in adherence of other religious traditions in their own ways, that those, only those who belong to their own group have access to truth and salvation to the exclusion of others, or in regarding others as infidels or heretics, or worse, as less than human. And that attitude is what makes religion a part of the cause of the division and dysfunction of our human family. It is this kind of attitude that makes religion a cause of the animosities and conflicts that people have with one another, and which also brings about religiously motivated violence. This attitude, if we come to reflect on it, really is one that is insulting and demeaning to the God of love who created all of us and who calls all of us to love one another as God has loved us and care for one another as we care for our common home, our earth that God has given us. Now, another view that, uh, another view looks at other religions also as containing some elements of truth and salvation, but which still regards one's own as the more complete, the more perfect and more advanced religion. So, this is a view that many Christians who regard themselves as liberal and open-minded may tend to take, thinking, oh yes, there's truth in other religions, but still, our Christian religion is superior to theirs. Theirs may have the truth also, but ours is the complete truth. We will insist, Christ is the way. Now, if we actually engage in dialogue and enter into genuine friendship with people of other faiths and traditions, we will realize how this is a condescending attitude and very disrespectful of those with whom we are engaging with or those with whom we have found true friendship. This kind of engagement and dialogue with others may open us to a rude awakening that the one we call Christ may be bigger than what we think in our narrow little self-enclosed minds. Christians need to be consistent with who we are as Christians and need to stand by that affirmation. Yes, Christ is the way, but who is Christ? I cannot go into all the detailed theological argumentations here or cite the scriptural uh, sources, but allow me to suggest a book that might open some things in this regard. There's a book by Franciscan priest, Father Richard Rohr, entitled The Universal Christ, and it's subtitled How a Forgotten Reality Can Change Everything We See, Hope For, and Believe. Now, if you are, in, if you are piqued by these comments, I would like to suggest maybe forming a book club to discuss this thought-provoking and eye-opening work of Father Rohr. This might also spur you in your reflections on being Christian in a multicultural and multi-religious world, the universal Christ. Now, let it be clear that I'm not invoking a kind of attitude here labeled as religious pluralism. Oftentimes, this term means you can have your religion and I can have mine and we can be friends, but let's not talk about the things that may lead to arguments like religion or politics for that matter. This would be another attitude that seems to fall short of the total engaging love that a Christian is called to live by. What I'd like to propose is what can be called a reverse inclusivist view of other religions. In short, it's not that your religion has some truth that can be and will be fulfilled in my Christianity, 
but the reverse, that my Christianity will not be fulfilled and complete without taking yours into account and engaging you towards mutual learning and enrichment. Raimundo Panicar, a, a Spanish Indian theologian, wrote a book in the mid 20th century entitled The Unknown Christ of Hinduism. And he suggested that in looking at the truths and the beautiful teachings of Hinduism that led so many people to lives of holiness, we may, we, from a Christian point of view, may find that there is an unknown Christ in that religion. Now, this is a view that holds that the fullness of Christ, the Christ who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, is beyond whatever any one of us can conceive or imagine and is still in the process of being fulfilled in our human history through the encounters and engagements of all of us who partake in the truth and salvation of that same Christ, bigger than what we currently imagine that Christ to be, leading us to greater and greater enrichment of our understanding and appreciation of one another's gifts, towards realizing more and more of the true fullness of Christ, as Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians and also to the Colossians where he writes, we are called to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that we may be filled with the fullness of God. And that can be only fulfilled as we get to interact with and encounter with and welcome people of the different faiths and religious traditions who are also seeking the truth within their traditions. And as we journey with one another, we find that common ground that common ground of love that can enable us to cooperate and collaborate in healing this broken earth. As we come to recognize and appreciate the particulari uh, particularities of each religious community and tradition and keep an open heart in learning from one another to share in one another's gifts, we are contributing to the greater realization of this fullness of Christ. Now, we say fullness of Christ from our own tradition, but respecting the otherness of others, they may not prefer to call it that, and they may prefer to, to call it in their own way, but at least as Christians, consistent with our own worldview, we break that open and make it something that needs the other to be truly fulfilled, and not thinking that we already have it and they only have part of it. So it's a reverse kind of mentality from saying we have the fullness and you don't, but the fact that unless we get together and learn from one another, none of us can really attain that fullness that our human hearts are longing for. As a Catholic Christian, I find a statement from the Second Vatican Council in a document entitled Nostra Etate, which laid out guidelines for relating to people of other faith traditions as an important reference point. It says there that we Christians are to reject nothing that is true and holy. Those are the words of that document. To reject nothing that is true and holy that we may find in the different religions of the world. But to put it in a more positive and proactive way, it's not that we reject nothing that is true and holy, but we are called to actively search out and acknowledge and recognize what is true and holy in the other traditions and that we are called to preserve and promote those good things, spiritual and moral, as well as the socio-cultural values found among them. So that is part of our mission as Christians, to go out and seek what is true and holy in others and acknowledge that, and acknowledge that as coming from them and not from us. The gifts of God to God's people, all of us. Christians then are called to be proactive in encountering and dialoguing and collaborating with followers of other religions, precisely to be true to what being Christian is all about. What then are some things that we may find, appreciate and learn from in the teachings and ways of life of people from different traditions? Let me give some general examples, and this is just a 
uh, tip of the iceberg that I would like to invite everyone to continue to study in more detail. But for example, from the many sacred traditions that continue, that continue to be practiced by indigenous peoples in different continents of the world, like the Native Americans or those who are in South America or in Africa or in Asia or in other countries, those that are called indigenous religious traditions may teach us how to appreciate the sense of sacredness of nature. And may, they may also teach us to be able to live in ways that can mitigate our current tendency to exploit and desecrate the natural world for our human ends, to put a stop to that kind of exploitation as we regard the sacredness of nature. We may learn the inestimable value and the sacredness of being in community in a way that would temper our tendencies toward individualism and the I, me, mine centered way of life that many of us in the um, industrialized countries tend to feel as the way we are consigned to live. We may also learn to treasure the sacredness of each present moment in a way that, we, that may put brakes on our tendency to carry on our day-to-day -day lives at a hectic pace, running from one thing to another without being able to appreciate what it is we are doing all of this for anyway. That's from the indigenous traditions and this deserves more study and more reflection on what we can learn from them. Now from the Hindu tradition, among the many things that invite us for deeper learning, we may also appreciate the key insight that we human beings are imbued with a longing in the depths of our heart for something that can never be satisfied with finite pleasures and possessions and power that is given in this world. This is a longing for something of no less than infinite horizons. In the Hindu tradition, this is referred to as Brahman, that which is beyond anything we can imagine, that which grows bigger and bigger. That's what the term Brahman means from its etymology. And yet at the same time, that reality that is bigger than anything we can imagine lies deep within our own innermost self as our Atman. So that holy reality that is beyond anything we can imagine is also found in the depths of our own selves. And as we look at one another, we find that we are all able to access that in our own inner journeys. That's one gift of Hinduism. From the Buddhist traditions, and I've learned a lot from the Buddhists, we may learn how to be mindful and cherish each moment as a gift, and also how to live in selfless ways empowered by compassion toward all beings. Now, from our Jewish brothers and sisters, acknowledging the parent tradition out of which our own Christian faith derives, we may learn from reading the book of Genesis, which we Christians also share as sacred scripture, of the goodness of creation. As God created heaven and earth, and all creatures big and small, including human beings, God saw that it was good very good. They may also learn how to value tradition and ritual as we go about in the ordinary things of our day-to-day -day life, as gifts to us humans from a loving God who cares for all of us in the dimensions of our life. And so what we can learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters is to enter into a rhythm of life, a ritual way in which we can honor that holy of which we can find in our midst, and so much more. And from our Muslim brothers and sisters, we may learn that a basic attitude in approaching our Creator is one of surrender, a surrender of our own egoistic mentality, of our own selfish interests, and giving ourselves to follow the will of God, dedicating ourselves, dedicating our lives toward justice and peace and equality and the brotherhood and sisterhood of all. That is something we can learn from our Muslim brothers and sisters. 
we might also be inspired if we have some Muslim friends ourselves to be a bit more intentional in our prayer life as we get to see how they make it a point to pray at least five times a day, taking a specific bodily posture that is conducive to acknowledging the holy in our midst at five different points of the day and make that something habitual and many more things we can learn. So to summarize this theme on being a Christian in a multi-religious world, a Christian is first of all called to embody that love that being Christian is all about. This love begins by being open to learning about and learning from those we regard as religious others. We learn about them and from them, respecting their otherness, also engaging them in open-hearted dialogue and encounters for sharing our gifts of faith with one another. And one very common and in our age all the more necessary way for people of different religious faiths can engage one another is through collaboration in common tasks of healing our broken communities, through dialogue forums, interfaith forums, collaborative activities in providing for the needs of the more vulnerable members of our wider community, addressing issues of poverty, injustice, racial divisions, and so on, cooperating also in tasks for ecological well-being. In Dallas, there are several such interfaith forums that are active in helping communities in their basic human tasks. And so please check out what they are. In many cities and towns of the, uh, the different parts of the world, there is a continuing need for religious leaders and members of various faith communities in that lo local area to get together and see what they may be able to offer in collaboration with one another's communities, addressing their common tasks as a, of, their, of our shared humanity. The list goes on. You may be already doing this, but may I respectfully suggest that the Congregation of St. Michael and All Angels consider expanding your offerings and outreach in this regard in what can be called interfaith ministry. In closing, allow me to share with you a gift I have received from my Buddhist friends which I trust may also be, be able to enrich your own life as well as Christians. It's the practice of pausing every now and then as we go through the daily activities of our life to take a deep breath and cherishing that moment right there, whatever it is we may be doing, wherever we may be. In pausing to take a deep breath, we may be able to open our hearts and minds to the very wonder and miracle of that very moment. We may be walking, sitting on a chair or couch, taking our coffee in the morning, pausing between emails when we're uh, doing our communications, waiting at the grocery line, or driving a car. These can be precious moments that we can recapture with this intentional act of taking a breath rather than missing these precious moments with a hectic mind always wanting to get to the next thing. And as we take this way of breathing in and breathing out every so now and then with that intention of living that very moment, heaven knows the kind of things that may come our way and that may open up to us. Try it. As the men's warehouse TV commercial used to say, I don't know whether they still air it now, the gentleman who founded Men's Warehouse says, I guarantee it. Now, it's not me, but it's the breath that is guaranteed to open our hearts and minds to the wonder and beauty of life every moment. Even in midst of those moments that we'd rather not have, like moments of suffering or pain or discomfort, take a deep breath and look at what might come to us through breathing through that moment. It may also open our hearts and minds to people in the world around us who are crying in pain, in need, and in their brokenness, in their suffering, and move us to offer ourselves in whatever we may be able to, um, uh, to do to help them even a little bit. 
so that breathing may loosen us up and open our hearts to the sufferings of others around us. For I was hungry and you gave me food. For I was lonely and you came to visit me. The good old Gospel of Matthew points us the way to being Christian in our, all, in our multicultural and multi-religious world. Thank you. <laughs>